שלום everybody, and uh, today we are talking about Parashat Ha'azinu, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, Dvarim, chapter 32, verse 1. This is a song. It is written in a very special way. If you look in the uh, Torah itself, the structure of the uh, Torah, the, the original, the handwritten Torah on the parchment, you have columns. Uh, depends the size of the Torah, the number of uh, the number of lines in every column. However, the way the Torah is written is also that when you come to Parashat Azinu, you write it <clears throat> as a song, which means it's written in two columns. Uh, which mean part of the uh, every verse, the first beginning is in on one column and the end is on the next column. So you read uh, across and you see the visual of the Torah. You see two columns uh, instead of one heavy column that is covering the whole uh, area. Now it's two columns with a white uh, blank space between. Uh, <clears throat> you have, according to that, uh, something special in this parasha because the uh, the uh, commentaries, especially the Zohar, is saying that if you look at the Torah on the physical realm, the physical dimension, it is a reflection of the upper uh, dimension. And in the upper dimension, there's no parchment, there's no ink, there is a uh, black fire and white fire. And in the upper dimension, it's a black fire right written over a white fire, which means there's much more white than black. And the deeper meaning is there's much more light than vessel. Uh, for instance, when we listen to a song, we need less to listen to the content. We have more the connection to the music, the rhythm. There is less intellectual and more uh, inspirational, uh, which basically what a song is about. A song is about delivering something that is beyond just then information. When you listen to a song, it's rarely that you say, I didn't understand it, because you're not listening to a song usually in order to receive information or to study. You listen to a song in order to be inspired. You can say after listening to a song, uh, I, I didn't like it, or I loved it so much, or it inspired me, got me emotional. No, it didn't touch me. But you're talking about something that is a much deeper level. This is the meaning of Parashat Azinu, and we're being told in the previous parasha, in Parashat Vayelech, uh, when we read it on chapter 31 in Deuteronomy, verse 30, And Moses spoke to the ears of the whole congregation of Israel, the words of this song till its completion. And here is the song, Parashat Hazinu. Hazinu Hashemayim Vadabera, listen heavens, and I will speak. Vetishma Haaretz Imayfi, and the earth will hear the words of my, the speech of my mouth. So, uh, you can already hear the rhythm of a song. Now you understand also the two columns because every sentence has a beginning and an end. You see the rhythm. Listen heaven and I will speak and the earth will hear the, 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 uh, the speech of my mouth. So you have two parts in every, every sentence is structured like this, uh, like a song. 
and you see the parallel between the beginning and the end of every verse. So it's here, the beginning is, listen the heavens to my, to, and I will speak, and the, her, and the, and the second part, and the earth will hear, okay, the word of my mouth, the speech of my mouth. And then verse two, Ya'arof kamatar likhi, my lesson will rain as rain, Okay, in Hebrew it sounds much better. And my words will flow down like dew. And then, kisirim alei es deshe uchervivim alei esev. So it's like, again, the comparison to the, um, the uh, droplets of rain on the, uh, after the rain, on the uh, blades of grass. So uh, that's how it goes. And of course, there's no message it's more uh, and there is a message of course in a song there is a message so our question is what is the message and we have we we already hear that in the beginning listen heaven Moses is talking to the heavens and then he uses different words the heavens are it's about listening, Hazinu, the name of the parasha, Vetishma Aretz, and the earth will hear. And we know there's a difference between hearing and listening. We hear a lot of stuff, but we listen only to a very small part of it. We get even a smaller portion of that. So, and the name of the parasha is Hazinu, and we have to also to see the importance because Parashat Azinu is always read after Rosh Hashanah. It's already in the month of Tishrei, in the holidays season. And the name of the month of Tishrei is also uh, in the astrological part, Mazal Moznaim, Moznaim. Moznai means the scales, Libra in Latin. However, Moznai come from the word Ozen, which means if you know Hebrew grammar, in Hebrew grammar, you have usually most of Hebrew words, they have a root. It's like, again, it's like English is made of words and there are many, many groupings of words because English is kind of a accumulation of uh, French, uh, German, uh, we have also uh, Latin, some Hebrew. It's a mix of many, many, men. That mix became the English language as we know only during the last few centuries. So that's why you have so many groups. Hebrew is a mostly structured, not from words, but from a structure like most Semitic languages, like Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, uh, that every word, either a noun or a verb, the big, 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 big majority is structured over what is called shoresh, the root. And the root, it's like, uh, like a root for any... Uh, function, if you know something about uh, equations in math. So in equations, you have X, Y, Z, and you, you put them in the equation. In the same thing in Hebrew, you have the three letters of the root. And in this case, the three letters of the word Ha'azinu is Aleph, Zayn, Nun. Aleph, Zayn, Nun is the same root as Moznaim, Libra, as Ha'azinu, Listen, it's the same root also of ozen and ear. Okay, so that's a noun. So uh, we have, and all of them reflect something about the ability to balance. So if you look in the parchment in the Torah again, you look first of all that. There, there's another law in, there's one law in the Torah that says that certain letters that must 
a certain words that must start a, a paragraph. It's in six places along the Torah that it must be, that that word must be the first word in the column, not the paragraph, the column. Uh, bef uh, we had one of them in uh, chapter 31, the previous chapter, verse 28, and the word is Ve'aida in verse 28, that word must be the head of the column. Now, because from Ve'aida till the end of Parashat Ve'elech, you have a, a bunch of letters, they make the top column as a regular column in the Torah. As we said, it's a text written right to left and a column. And then, after a few lines written like this, then chapter 32, Azinu, you start with two columns. So what happens? You have few lines that are written along the whole width of the column. And then underneath, you have two columns. So you have something that looks like the Hebrew letter Chet, uh, what looks like the English letter N. So you have a top, uh, like a lintel, and then you have two dough posts on the side, so it looks like the Hebrew letter Chet or the English letter uh, N. The next, the next column, it will be again the same thing. There will be two columns and then a bottom. So then it looks like the English letter U. And what you you get over here, you have three like like uh, a door, the two door posts, mezuzot and the door post and the door post the, the top the lintel I'm sorry the lintel so you look at it and you have three parts and if you know a little bit in about Kabbalah and you know that one of the major uh, uh, pillars of Kabbalistic teaching is that the universe is made and run by three forces one force is the male force the force of the light, the creator, heavens. The other force is the female force, which is the creation, the vessel, light and vessel, creator, creation, light and vessel. So when you look at this, you need also in order for these two forces to function together, you need a third force. This is the force that uh, synthesizes both into uh, a viable force of life, which means if the force of the creator is overpowering, then the force of the creation is nullified and there's no creation, there's nothing. If the force of the creation is overpowering too much, then it suffocates itself because the force of the creator is nullified and then is nothing. So you need to have a force that unites the two, synthesizes the two, which is called the central column. And that is a central column. And that central column, the synthesis, is what life is about. When every human being can manage synthesizing the two forces, which mean in everyday life, we explain it many times, you have the right column force. This is the force of the creator, the force of the light, the force of giving. When this force is overpowering the other force, which is the force of receiving the vessel, then you know when a person is giving without any limitation, without any limitation, finally he wills because uh, we are not a source of light, we're humans, and we wilt, and then we, we become, uh, we're being depleted. So then we are depressed, we're upset, we're disappointed. Uh, why? I gave so much and I got so little. Or if you take too much, then the left side overcomes and it's too powerful, then it has a tendency to burn itself down without the love of sharing. So, 
If we understand that it's all about these three forces, and we know that the meaning of the words, remember, let's go back to the uh, to the letters Aleph, Zayin, Nun. As we said, this is for the sign of Libra. This is for the ear. This is also for listening. But more than everything, it's about Aleph, Zayin, Nun is Izun, balance. Balance between the two forces of life that if they are not, in case they are not balanced, then we have what we call problems or better to say challenges. Okay? Usually, we are being challenged by having the left side overpowering, which means selfishness, egotism, uh, materialism, when that side, the left side, becomes too powerful and it's not balanced by the right side, the light side, the giving side, then usually this is the major source of human problems since the beginning of the history of humanity. When people take too much, what happens when you have a society that people take too much? You have too little for society to exist, and then it falls apart. So whenever you have a society or community or company, that the people that comprise that group of people is about, it's all about taking, taking, it's a bunch of takers, sooner or later, it's like you uh, build a bank for the community, but everybody's just drawing out money for the bank, and very soon the bank will go bankrupt. The whole thing about the bank, that more people invest in the bank than pull money out of it. So then there's always a moment of need, sometimes by surprise, something by accident, something by planning. You need, you go to the bank and you take money so you can start building something. You start a, a project, a startup. Okay, but if people pull out of the bank more than they put in, uh, then when you are in need, you have no, nothing to uh, withdraw. You cannot take a loan. You cannot withdraw anything from your savings because the bank is simply stopped to exist. So the same thing over here, because we have to balance the giving and the taking, the heaven and the earth, the light and the vessel, and that is the art of living. Being alive means that you know how to balance. When you come to the magical definition of the universe before we got out of balance, that was the tree of life. If you look at the tree of life, the uh, symbolism of the tree of life, you see three columns. On the right, you see Chochma, Bina, Chochmah Chesed Hod, I'm sorry, Chochmah Chesed Netzach, Chochmah Chesed Netzach, this is, and you see a line on the right from top to bottom. On the left, you see Bina, Gvua, Hod, this is the left column. And in the middle, in the middle, you see Keter, Dad, Tif Eret, Yesod, that's a central column. So it's right column, left column, central column. And the art of living is to know how to balance. So you have two kinds of balance. One is to balance between the right and left and synthesize. You know, some, there are many religions that are fake because the moment a religion is emphasized about don't take, you have to detach, suppress, remove any kind of taking you're not supposed to take. You're supposed only uh, to give. Uh, what happens? You're trying to bring up the right column. What happens when you suppress the left column? Finally, either the, uh, the person wills or he rebels and explodes. The same thing if you go on the opposite which means when you are moving out of religion, 
and you start to, to develop your own religion, which happened to humanity in the last, especially in the last uh, two centuries, uh, we humans, we are smart enough to develop our own logic of how to manage life. And what came out? The religion of narcissism, hedonism, and egotism, which means I am in the center and it's all about me. If I don't, and I'm simply here to take, I am, I'm here to take the most and give as minimum as possible. What happens? When the left column overpowers the right column, then you get burned, according to the wisdom of Kabbalah. Which we, and that, what does it mean you get burned? Uh, first of all, uh, depression. Depression and all kinds of diseases that are related to egotism, anger, selfishness, and so on. The, the, the desire to get the most and give the less. What do you get out of it? First of all, loneliness. When you live among people and you, you need to share in order to be part of something, a couple, family, uh, community, whatever. So people don't like it anymore. So people don't get married. Why? If I get married, I have to give. I have to give time, energy, money to my spouse, to my children. I don't want to. I want to have everything for myself. You become lonely. You become lonely because you don't want to give. So you don't understand that it's investment. When you give to a family member, friends, family, community, you are building the bank. So in the moment of need, you have friends, you have energy, to pull and draw from the bank so you can create something or as investment. You have enough energy to build yourself above the level you have before. But if you don't have friends, you don't have family, you have anybody, you just count on yourself. You can't. You When you realize you're lonely and you're really alone, there's nobody with you. That's your you have much less. As we know, without a banking system, you can't build businesses. You cannot just build businesses with your own money. Usually you take a loan and then you start a startup and you have investment, whatever. You need a, a community. You need to think about giving some value to others if you want to achieve your own crazy ideas. Crazy is not bad. You know, the crazy people, Steve, uh, Steve Jobs used to say, the crazy people who wanted to change the world, they're the ones who change it. So there's nothing wrong about having crazy ideas, but crazy ideas without any community and people around you, you'll never be able to manifest them. And we're humans. We have imagination. We need to think crazy. We need to get out of the box. Otherwise, we'll be suffocated inside the routine, okay? Just a little bit about it. It's not the whole wisdom, but just a taste of it. So, but, so the whole thing about the month of Tishrei is about balancing. So what do we have to balance the most? As I said before, the main, the first thing people need to balance is egotism. First thing, selfishness. And that's why the first 10 days of the month of Tishrei, from Rosh Hashanah till Yom Kippur, it's about balancing our left side, our left column, the balancing our desires, balancing them and not getting rid of them. If we get rid of human desires, we subdue them, detach from them, suppress them, this is horrible. Because human society is based on the desire and the need. And we know the necessity is a matter of all invention. So we, whoever tries to think that religion is about, you know, you have to detach yourself from your desires and, and, uh, and cravings, uh, this is a lie because the, Kabbalistically, according to... Uh, 
the Torah, Kabbalah. The world was created for one purpose and one purpose alone. God the Creator Almighty he is the endless source of power, life, and energy. And His light needs a vessel to expand into. If you have a power that gives, that power manifests itself through giving to someone who needs, receives, enjoys the giving that you have. Without that, what we call the vessel, there's no creation. There's no giving power if there's no receiving vessel. We were created, human vessels, human souls, for one purpose, one purpose alone, to receive. We are creatures of desire. The moment you try to abolish, defame, uh, detach from the desire to receive, you go against the creation itself. You go against the creator himself. You try to deny the purpose of the whole creation. Any kind of culture that will try to make you feel ashamed because you want to be happy, that is against the creation itself. We're here to be happy. And that's why when these Kabbalistic ideas somehow infiltrated into the modern world, you have some of that idea in the book of uh, uh, Dan Brown, uh, The Da Vinci Code, which he hides it under uh, the story of the Holy uh, Goblet, the Holy Grail. Okay, But the Holy Grail was the teachings of Kabbalah that infiltrated into uh, those people like Da Vinci, like Newton, like uh, Leibniz, like uh, Thomas Jefferson, like uh, Benjamin Franklin, all of them realized that, and that is what guided them in creating the basic ideas of modern humanism. The first thing is the right of the human being for happiness. Why? This is an undeniable right because humanity was created from the force of the creator with one purpose, that we will be happy. And because it's a divine force and a divine decision, no one can abolish this thing. And that that's why it has to be uh, the beginning of every human constitution, of any human society. The moment you go against it, you destroy society. And, you know, many societies, they decline slowly. The Soviet uh, communist constitution was amazing. It spoke about happiness and equality and love and stuff like this. They didn't really mean that. They never, they never lived like this. And the moment you don't do that, what was the result? They wilted and collapsed and disappeared, like all tyrannies in the history of humanity. Okay? So uh, only when you create a society that is truly genuinely, authentically committed to restore the well-being of the individuals, only then it's going to work. Why? Because it goes along the uh, basic rules of nature. But you cannot just give. You have to make every individual understand that he must receive and give and you have to synthesize should be you if each one of us will be healthy he has a healthy human life when you enjoy the giving as much as you enjoy the receiving and you enjoy both of them because you know that you get when you give and when you when you give you get same thing when you know when every interaction must be this way, what is called win-win. And that's a tree of life consciousness. Now, the purpose of Shata Zinu is to connect us to the idea of Rosh Hashanah. So yes, it was written, Shata Zinu, is the basic, like the song, the swan song of Moses on the day that he left physical earth. 
That was, he said, that he said to us in the previous parasha, parashat Vayelech, today I am 120 years old. And today I'm leaving this world. Okay? And I know that you're going to uh, go off the, the road and you go astray and you're going to mess up. Why? Because humans. And humans, they're very good at making mistakes, all of us. And whoever says he doesn't make mistakes, he'll be lying about other things too. And you should be really, really be careful about that human being because he's dangerous, first of all, for himself and then for his environment. Humans are making mistakes. The Torah, the rest of the Bible, the, the Hebrew Tanakh, does not ever speak about perfect human beings. Why? Because perfect human beings exist only in the upper world. On our planet, there's no righteous person that will do only good without sinning. We're here to fail. Okay? Why? Because you're being tested by how do you get out of failure, not if you don't fail. Like in many religions, if you fail, you're finished. You're not allowed to fail. That you, you're in a lost case in the first place because a human being without failure, that's our second name. You know, being a human being, you fail. If you don't fail, you don't learn, you don't exist, you don't, you don't live. And if you try to deny failure, just the moment that you're afraid of failing, you fail already. Because you never try. You don't try, and so you don't fail. But you fail by not trying, because life is about revealing no horizons every year, at least every year, not just every day. Otherwise, why did I get up in the morning? To live yesterday all over again? No. No, that, that's used up. Like I used up bubble gum. No, every day is a new creation. Never existed before in the history of humanity. Use it. Don't miss it. Don't miss the opportunity. But if you miss the opportunity, don't kill yourself for that because then you miss the next opportunity. They will come all the time in front of you. So it's all about learning how to balance. Learning that we're here to love others, but we're here also to love ourselves. We're here to enjoy life and to receive, but we're here also to make other people enjoy and give them also. And we need to see this as one whole complete system. So, as we said, Parashat Azinu is always read in the month of Tishrei. In the month of Tishrei, the first 10 days, which are called the days of R, Yamim Noraim, they are the days that we use fear in a positive way. It's the fear of the Almighty, not the fear of our mistakes. In a, in a way that contracts us, but the R of the greatness of the creation so we can be attentive and that's the meaning of the word hazino it's listening in an attentive way basically reaching such a level of state of mind is balancing when you are aware attentively and you're listening to the sound of the creation, which is here the song of the creation, you will in a, it will you you will get more balanced in a faster way. And that is the message. Of course, we have also correcting the right column. And the right column, the giving, whatever, these are the days from the end of Yom Kippur, just a night following Yom Kippur, till uh, the end of Sukkot, the holy day of Sukkot. This is the, these days are about giving, caring, hosting, sharing, making other people, making ourselves happy. It's all about rejoicing with life. And then the last day, Simchat Torah, the day after Sukkot, the 22nd day of Tishrei, 
It's Simchat Torah. It's about the wedding between the heaven and the earth, the body and the soul, the giving and the receiving, humanity and wisdom. And that is Simchat Torah. And that's why, like in a wedding, we have Chatan, a groom. It's a, you have it in the uh, uh, ceremonies of the, uh, the most important readings of the Torah. The reading that completes the reading of the whole five books of Moses is the person who's reading is called Chatan Torah, the groom of the Torah. Immediately after him comes another one who starts to read the beginning of Genesis. He's called Chatan Bereshit, the groom of Genesis. Okay, and we do seven circles of dancing, like several circles of that the bride uh, in Ashkenazi weddings makes around the groom. So we are the bride, we have the groom, the wisdom, and we get together so we can celebrate the beginning of a new year after we worked on balancing all three aspects. Make sure to realize that in the ear, you have a very important organ, the organ that is responsible for the human balance. And it's made of three arches, okay? These three arches are responsible for the human balance and when they're not balanced, uh, well, this is a terrible disease because you're messed up so much. Uh, any kind of disease that gets this three arches in the ear, the inner ear, an imbalance, terrible. So we are here in order to balance ourselves and to balance the universe. How do we do that? So let, let us uh, get to understand uh, as we said before, the name of the parasha Azinu, and also again Moznaim, it's all about attentive listening. And what does it mean? We can have a lot of uh, interpretations for that. The one that I want to bring right now is the, uh, the commentary of Rabbi Chaim ben Atar, or Chaim HaKadosh. עוד נתכוון שדיבר עם שני הרכבות שמהם בנוי האדם. אחד חלק הרוחני שהתייחס בשם השמיים, ואחד חלק הגופני שהתייחס בשם הארץ. The beginning of the parasha is talking about when Moses started to speak, he says, listen heavens, and all the heavens are like, who is there talking to us? And then hear earth. And the earth is also, who are you to talk? And like, and that was Moses, that he can get the heaven and the earth to listen to him. That's very nice for the song. Okay, but what's in it for me? Just to show how great was Moses. Uh, it's nice, but again, what's practical about it? So Chaim HaKadosh, the Rabbi Chaim ben Atta was a great Kabbalist of the 16th, 17th century. Uh, was born in Morocco and he lived the, uh, the rest of his life, the elder life uh, in uh, Jerusalem. He's buried here in Mount Olives, not far from here. So he said the most important valuable part of it is that, that he meant to speak about the two parts of a human being. One, is the spiritual part of the human being, which is the heavens. That part, the soul, the spiritual aspect of every human being, the spiritual dimension, that is coming from the heavens, that relates to the heavens, that has always the yearning to reunite with the heavens. How do we know? Because we all have moments in which the body consciousness somehow fades away accidentally or not accidentally, or it's beaten up terribly. And then you realize how the deeper part yearns to the heavens, to spirituality. And it was always there. It was just subdued by 
the lower part, the body that relates to the earth. How do you know it relates to the earth? The creation of Adam. Adam was created from earth. Okay? You know what they, they say in the West, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. This is a lie. It doesn't say so. It says earth to earth, soil to soil. Adam is created from Adama, soil. Okay? Not ashes. We're not made from ashes. We're not made of dust. We're made of earth. Earth, if you start learn about the four elements, is water, fire, air, and earth. We're earth. The earth is a substance that our body is made of. But our soul is made of the heavens. And the heaven and the earth unites in every human being. As long as we are alive, we are an amalgamate of a soul, heaven, and a body, earth. And that has to live in peace with each other. And when they're not in peace with each other, uh, that's the pain that most of us experience during our lives. So, now we can understand why this parasha is being read in a, such a crucial time every year, because every year, when Rosh Hashanah is coming, and the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but especially the two days of Rosh Hashanah and the day of Yom Kippur, on these days, it's like there's a, there's a power that is called Nesira, Nesira, sowing. Who is being sowed? It's like God is sowing the connection between the body and the soul so they can, like, like in a sleep case, what happens when we are asleep? You know, the, the body soul relations is very trouble for you, most human beings. And therefore, we are tired. Why are we are tired? Because the battle goes on through the whole day. And the result is that the soul and the body both are so exhausted, they can't, they can't uh, live with each other anymore. So what happens when we go to sleep? The soul goes to recuperate in the higher dimensions and the body recuperates, just leave me alone and let me just heal while I'm asleep on my bed. Okay, that's what sleep is about. So the two can recuperate and then the soul comes back into the body when we wake up in the morning and the battle is starting all over again. So, one of the symptoms of a spiritual human being, when people really are coming to terms and they learn how to bring peace between the heavens and the earth, fighting inside them, that you don't need to sleep that much. You simply know how to heal much faster uh, and you don't need all, so many hours. So a lot of great sages, you hear about them, but they were sleeping very few hours every night. Why? Because they, they didn't have any need. The recuperation of the soul and the body when they went to sleep was in a different rate and scale. So the same thing, but in a larger scale, is happening on the first 10 days in every uh, biblical year. Which means when we're talking about the biblical year, the cosmic year, when we when we start uh, counting the years from Passover, that's the years from the redemption from Egypt. But when we are talking about counting from Rosh Hashanah, this is from the creation of the universe and the creation of Adam. What does it mean? That we can go back to the beginning so we can have an extended connection to that awesome event of the creation. And that's why in the word Bereshit, in the beginning, translated into English in the beginning, which is very poor uh, translation, in the word Bereshit, 
you can find the letters Aleph Betishrei, the date of the creation, the first day in the month of Tishrei. You can, if you rearrange the order of the word of the letters of Bereshit. What is the source of the word Bereshit? Rosh. The head. Where does everything happen? Where is the command? The head. The head of state, the head of the house, the head of the company. In a person's head. You know, first of all, you think and then you act. If you are a normal human being. Okay? First you think, then the thought moves uh, some messages in the nervous system and then the muscles start to move. So the thought comes before the action and that's in the head. More, more than that, in the word Bereshit, you have the letters for Yereboshit. Somebody who has an awe and shame from the heavens which means you're not thinking all the time what do people think about me, but you think a lot about how do I look in the upper world, which means am I am loyal authentically to my true calling. And that's another part of the word Bereshit. So, Something magical happens every year as the new Hebrew year is coming. The last year, power of life simply comes to an end. And on the beginning of the new year, the creator is bringing the whole creation into its beginning, which means what's the first thing that happened in the beginning? And God said, let there be light, which means God instills the light into the universe. And of course, in order for the light to be injected into the universe, there must be a vessel to receive that light. And on verse 5 in Genesis 1, it says that there was a night, there was a day, one day. There was a night. Uh, which means the vessel, which is darker than the light of the creation. And there is the light of the creation. And they are one, one day, not first, one. And the moment it says one, it means there's no other. The whole creation, from the point of view of the creator, the whole creation was completely done, finished, and achieved. End of story. The light has been spread and given. The vessels received that light, all human souls, and everything was one in one single point. The middle point, as the Kabbalists call it, for thousands of years. So, scientists about a hundred years ago revealed that the whole universe started from one point with no dimensions of right and left, up and down, no time. One point, everything was one. And then there was a big bang. Why was there a big bang? On Rosh Hashanah. Because we were created in the image of God. And we were not created just as darkness. We had wills and desires that we wanted to be, to emulate the creator, we wanted to create our own happiness. We wanted to create our own giving and sharing like the creator. So we pushed away the light. The result was, it's a long evolutionary process, the Kabbalists explained, and one of them was a big bang. Physicality has been created. Lack has been created. Chaos has been created. And we were created as humans so we can put things together and feel great about it. How do you know how to put things together? Have you ever think about it like there's a designer, an artist, they're looking at their creation and they feel like something is missing, something is missing. Then they move a little something. They add some touch over here, over there, some color, whatever. 
finally, now it's okay. What's okay? How? Why it was not okay before? Now, now, before it was not the... Why it was not right? It didn't feel right. So like some artists are saying, I am not creating something. I'm revealing something that was there before. Why? Because of the most beautiful creations of art, science, whatever, it was all there when it was one. There was a night, there was a day, one day. Now we have to reveal and create it on our own. When we create harmonious state of anything, we create we basically reveal what was there before, but now we own it because we are the cause for it. So what is the main purpose of parashat Tazino? if you read the parasha carefully? So we basically reveal, so verse three, Kishem Hashem I'll call the name of God, bring greatness to our God. Hatsur tamim pa'olok yichod rachav mishpat. And that's verse 4. El emunah ven avel. Whatever God is doing is calculated and it is just as, just as happening. First of all, when you don't, when it's coming to Rosh Hashanah, when it's coming to the new year, we look at the year that passed and Oh my God, this, the last year was very, very, very heavy and painful. A lot of horrible stuff happened. And yes, a lot of people are asking, why? Where was God when? And then the answer is, Moses is saying, you want to stay sane? Remember, you don't see the whole picture. You will see it one day. When you figure out that everything that happens has a reason. And remember, you have a soul, you have a body. The soul is eternal, the body is not. Remember that. The body is just a tool of the soul. The soul needs to overcome the challenges the body is facing to the soul. And that's the purpose of, this, of the body at that stage of human existence. God is always giving love and kindness every year on Rosh Hashanah. All human destination, destinies are being written, carved from the human actions of the previous years. And everything that happens to every human being is just the shortest way in order to achieve joy, happiness, and fulfillment. You don't achieve it in one lifetime. You need another one, and another one, and another one, till you do it right. But you grow and you experience. So you come to Rosh Hashanah, don't come with complaints to God. That's not going to help. You have to remember that everything that happened was right. Now, the, the question is, how do I relate to it? So we have to remember you don't. And then you have on verse 6. Ha ladonai pigmeluzot. And there's a, the only place in the Torah there's a letter that is being written as an independent word. And it is written also. Ha. Uh, in Hebrew, it's equivalent to the in English. T-H-E. Okay? But, and it's also, that's a meaning. But it's never written by itself. In English, you have the, uh, you know, before a noun. Okay? Uh, that's the way it is. In Hebrew, the hey is connected to the noun that follows. Okay? So, uh, here it's not. And it's a big letter. And there are three sizes of letters in the Torah. When we have a big, most of the letters of the Torah are middle-sized letters. Medium. And why? Because the medium letters connect to Zeranpin, the spiritual world. Which is what the Torah symbolizes. But the big letter much bigger than the, the others over here, ha, symbolizes the olam haba, the world to come. It's not just a spiritual world. It's the world that is beyond it. 
the world that we connect to in order to be nourished. This is the world, Bina, that we receive, Mother, I, our life for the next year to come. And here, this letter appears over here. So, this is the connection in this uh, Shah. And the Zoe is saying, if you realize what the parasha is talking about and you read it carefully, uh, the Zohar of Parashat Azino, verse 2. All the words of Moses, even this parasha that Moses is warning us, you will fall, you'll create a lot of havoc and chaos. Okay, but it's always with love. Why remember all what we go through? It's all with love. Even though it looks sometimes like some people say, you know, God hates me. No, he doesn't. He loves you unconditionally. No matter what you do, he can never change God's love to you or to any human being. Because God is endless. So you cannot change. We have to remember he is above time. We are under the illusion of time. When you look at the human being, as the Kabbalists explain, and you see a, a human being that is not really nice, he's not well-baked, he's not ripe yet. You know, all fruits on the tree or on the uh, plant, they're terrible tasting till they're ripe, right? You don't judge them by the taste they have while they grow and develop. You're always judging them by the taste when they are ripe. Remember that. Look at the human being that is the most horrible human being. He's simply, you know, uncooked, unripe, still in the making. You don't show half work to a fool, correct? But if you're wise enough, you realize that the creator he is above time he can see that every human being goes through the process. He will make sure each one of us will go through the process. Sometimes we have to go through very harsh moments in order to be able to reach that great moment of being ripe and ready and cooked. So the taste shows up, but some, we need to go through a process. You know, some fruits... And still, when they're being picked up from the from the plant of the field, from the tree, they're horrible tasting. You need to cook them. And then the taste comes out. Uh, olives. Did you ever try to eat an olive off the tree? When it's ripe, even horrible taste. It's so bitter. You need to squeeze, to heat, to uh, heat till the very valuable olive oil comes out. That's not easy. Most humans are like this. If you're not being pushed, if you're not being under pressure and heat, you won't let go of the olive oil that that's your essence. You have to remember that. So what is Rosh Hashanah is about? It's all about remembering the unconditional love of God to each one of us. On the other hand, to remember that yeah, our actions, they are our Satan or our guardian angel. It depends on us. The moment we basically, and it's easier on Rosh Hashanah till Yom Kippur, to get balance again. Why? It's easier to achieve that awe of God. Awakening it inside us. And awakening, because that is what the, the whole, if you read the story, it's all about that. The whole, it's not a story, the song of Moses. It's a gift. In order to realize that even if we have been beaten up, if you make mistakes, 
We make horrible mistakes. It looks like we make God angry. He can't. It just says, verse 20, and God said, I will hide my face away from them. I'll see what happens with them. When God hides himself, and then you don't see justice, and you get scared, and you get upset. And in the beginning, you become, you know, you get those trauma. You blame, you're angry, you're upset. And then after a while, when you mature and you get more ripe, you realize that everything basically, basically, you needed to go through it in order to become the better person you became. And you become thankful. But if you have awe of God, it, it's easier and shorter. Because you realize that all of that pressure and negativity and injustice was, just, was done just for you so you grow bigger, greater, and wiser. And then you realize, if you read the, the song, verse 29, if they just get wise enough and they will understand and they see the results, and they realize that nothing happened to you by mistake. It's all for a reason that finally we will be reach our destiny. So the prayer on Rosh Hashanah is not just for ourselves to, re to reach that, that gift, that state of mind that realizes that everything that happens is for a reason, even though we do not always understand. But there's a bigger picture. And the most precious thing is not the body, it is the soul. And the soul gets ripened and sometimes the body has to go through hardships in order for the soul to get balanced because sometimes the body gets too overpowering and then the soul is suffocated and then only when the troubles happen, then the soul comes out. And Another thing, it's a message not just for Jews. It's the, the game, the goal, the story. It's for every human being. It applies to every human being. And that's why on Rosh Hashanah, we pray for the whole of humanity to achieve that awareness. We pray God to come in in such a thrust of power so every human soul will have irreversible transformation towards getting closer to the awe of God. And when we get that, we'll have a better year. We'll be able to overcome our body. We'll be able to have, to understand that it's not the fight who's getting richer, who's getting more powerful, who's taking over, who controls whom. No, it's not. It's a fake fight. It's all about how do we cooperate? How do we give and then we get? How do we get and then we give? How do we really create that harmony that all nations of the world should achieve in order to reach basically our calling as the creation of God? Happy New Year for everybody. And make sure on this Rosh Hashanah, because the world is craving for that, to pray for that power of awareness, of awe, will be awakened all over the world, stronger than ever. Because that power is stronger than ever, it's already time. We're getting really close. Thank you. Shana Tova.